My grandpa had one hell of a war. He turned 18 in December of 43, got drafted almost right away, then landed in France sometime in the fall of 44. His outfit was some kind of supply company that operated to the rear of the front line, so he didn't see much actual fighting. All he did was load trucks, drive someplace, and then unload them. Then just a few months later, the leader of Deutschland, as you know him, blew his brains out. The war was over, but my grandpa's service was not, and instead of heading home like a lot of the battle-hardened infantry units, grandpa stayed in Germany and continued to load trucks. Then one day, some high-ranking officer showed up at my grandpa's unit and starts asking where he is. My grandpa's name was Murphy, he's Irish, but only on my great-grandpa's side. His mother had been a German immigrant and had spoken a heck of a lot of the old language around him when he was a kid, so much so that despite not being able to speak German, he could sure as heck understand it. There was such a demand for translators at the time that army intelligence was searching up anyone of even the slightest German heritage in hopes that they'd be able to help translate documents or interpret conversations. But then, in the case of my grandpa, he was given a very different kind of task. When he'd confirmed that my grandpa could understand enough German to be of use to him, the officer told him to get into his jeep, then off they drove to some intelligence unit where my grandpa and a bunch of other soldiers could get a short briefing. Long story short, they were two poses, guards, and various prisoner of war camps, but their real job was to just listen. Anyone higher than a private first class was to receive a very temporary demotion, and each of them was to master the art of looking very bored and very dumb. My grandpa said the first part was easy, because for the most part, German POWs talked about the same crap American soldiers did. They complained about the latrines, about the food, and about each other, all very inoffensive stuff. Then one by one, depending on the kind of stuff that they'd been up to during the war, they were either hanged, forced into labor battalions, or given their freedom. My grandpa said that over the months that followed, his camp's population kept shrinking and shrinking until there were rumors that they were going to close the place down altogether. Then one day, hundreds of these SS guerrillas marched right up to the camp's gates, flying this big old white flag and asked to surrender. Turns out this rogue unit of Germany's most loyal bodyguards had been hiding out in the woods for months, and when they weren't taking pot shots at Americans, they were terrorizing the local Germans for collaborating with the U.S. Friendly forces had been trying to starve the rogue unit out for a while, so they figured their surrender was simply a natural result of their efforts. There was just one problem. The camp's guard contingency had been scaled down as the number of prisoners began to dwindle, meaning that by the time these SS guys showed up, there were eight prisoners for every one American camp guard. At first... The camp's commander was somehow completely fine with this and saw it was an opportunity to prove how just a handful of American boys could keep a lid on hundreds of rabid SS. But he was wrong, and if it hadn't been for my grandpa, a lot of people would have paid with their lives. Grandpa said that one day he was on guard duty when, for the first time during his whole stay at the POW camp, he heard something that sounded vaguely suspicious. All these hardened SS prisoners had been on their best behavior. Not a single one had stepped out of line. But then after my grandpa overhears one say to another, how much longer will we have to wait? Which was a fairly common question among the prisoners. The other replied, warten auf das Signal. Which means, we wait for the signal. Now obviously, my grandpa is thinking, what signal? but he had also been explicitly ordered to report anything like that to his superiors. Words like plan, plot, or code. These were all things that were of great interest because the main goal by that point was to prevent war criminals from escaping or destroying evidence of their crimes. But signal, that was something else entirely. The second his superiors heard about someone throwing the word signal around, they flooded the camp with extra guards, then got my grandpa to point out the soldiers that he'd heard use it. Sometime later, I imagine after an extensive period of interrogation, one of the SS guys finally talks and gives up their whole crazy plan. You see, all these SS fanatics might have showed up flying a white flag, but 
they hadn't really surrendered. Like I mentioned, they'd been hiding out in the area for months, following out Germany's final order to fight to the bitter end, but they never hit the POW camp on account of it being full of Germans. They also never opted to mount any kind of prison break, but by that time, that was neither here nor there, I guess. And so one day, a few SS scouts snuck up to the camp and happened to notice that there was only a handful of prisoners, but more importantly, only about two dozen camp staff and guards. They reported this back to their commander who came up with an extremely fiendish plan. Fake a surrender, overwhelm the camp guards, then loot weapons and ammo to continue their partisan struggle against the Americans. But the SS didn't just want weapons and ammo. Oh no, they had a much bigger prize in mind, and that prize was American uniforms. If they could disguise themselves as Americans in unblemished uniforms, the SS could amount devastating attacks on our boys, especially if you had an SS soldier disguised as, say, an American officer, of which there were plenty of the camp staff. By overhearing that word signal and bringing it to the attention of his superiors, my grandpa saved countless lives. So many, in fact, that his superiors sought to award him a bronze star. I thought they only gave those things out for combat-related heroism. Turns out they award them for other things, too. They just gotta be real significant kinds of things to be worth considering. The whole thing made him a minor celebrity among the boys he served with, and around six months later, he was discharged and sent home. My grandpa never considered himself a hero. He always said that he was simply doing his job. But I got the medal and the citation that proves that he saved, and I quote, scores, if not hundreds of lives. And to me, that's just about plain a definition of a hero as it's possible to get. <laughs>